Thank you so much. I want to make comment about uh, that whole emphasis in just a minute, but I do want to pass on my own congratulations to the um, uh, volleyball team for you girls. That is no easy feat to um, win a national championship, much less seven over these last few years. And uh, uh, kudos to Coach Denny. You've got an excellent, excellent coaching staff. Her husband's not a bad guy either, but um, they are wonderful people, and you're blessed to, to have that. So uh, you see many more to come. Congratulations also to the soccer team. Uh, they played so well. I, I hated to see any one of the teams lose, um, but uh, well-deserved. And I'm looking forward to seeing them playing again today. It was great to be able to see them work hard, outstanding play. And uh, I say that particularly because of the colleges that we draw our staff from. Uh, these are the ones that, as you folks, are working shoulder to shoulder when you get out into ministry, um, are the ones that you particularly, those of you that might be out and God called to other parts of the world, a chance to be able to develop camaraderie that's so important. And so your days of college being able to play together and knowing that at the end of the, get, the end of the day and end of the game, be able to uh, walk away and appreciate one another is um, is so needed. And I'm thankful. We're thankful for for uh, Clearwater and uh, a wonderful staff. I appreciate your administration particularly, and um, so many of the friends we've had over the years. And this week being a hard week for you, wrapping it all up. And uh, and next week, I understand you have um, the whole week off. So that is. Um, got to be worth the effort this week, so encourage you to stay at it and uh, do well because uh, Turkey is waiting for you soon enough and it'll be a great, uh, great time. So continue to work hard at all that. I'm thankful also for the emphasis for those of you that are veterans, particularly for our colleges that we constantly need to be reminded of that emphasis. We are living in Guam um, that we see it and feel it all the time because uh, Guam is the westernmost U.S. territory that the United States owns. And so if you were to get on a plane, as I mentioned before, and you fly to Hawaii, you get another plane and fly seven more hours, you would be um, on the island of Guam. Another three hours and you'd be on anywhere of the eastern Asian seaboard, uh, Manila, up to Taiwan, Japan, obviously China, and then down south, you fly three hours south, you'd be on the northern end of Australia. So that's where Guam is. Being the westernmost territory right now, the United States obviously um, is very active involved in the Middle East, and well we should be, and uh, may I add, I don't know that we're ever going to come out of that. That is the, the navel of the world, that is the conflict in which um, our end of our world will end up being. But there's a great concern for China, and so hence... Um, uh, over the next five years, uh, in coordination with Japan, they're planning to spend, our United States, $13 billion, with a B, on the island of Guam. Uh, six of that $13 billion Japan is putting in to move 8,000 Marines and their dependents down on this little island of 20 by 10, 200 square miles or so, and um, probably another 40,000 other dependents in military activities. So we have military that is there, and our ministry at Harvest, we do have an outreach to the military, a lot of young servicemen and women that are there on the island, two, three-year stays. So we have a strategy as that grows in ministry that we have an ongoing ministry with them as well. But our primary emphasis is with our islanders um, in that local and regional area, the Micronesians, the Macronesian Island, and then um, the whole uttermost uh, where we live, for the United States, we live in the uttermost. If you take the globe and move it this way, uh, you would be on Guam. So for your uttermost, for us now, becomes our local uh, Jerusalem and, and ongoing outreach. And so we're able to have our outreaches, particularly with our academy. And that's why we're here. And if you have interest in a missions mind, the passion for people, a love for the Lord, and um, education, as a training base, this would be a great fit for you. We look for folks looking for three-year commitments, three ten-month commitments. So your summers are off. We give you money to be able to get back here if you'd like to the United States or take mission trips, particularly up into that part of the world. 
I'm reminded of being Veterans Day also as you were talking about this. My mind went back to just a few years ago and had the opportunity um, to fly up to Iwo Jima. It's about an hour and a half north of us. I was on a flight with a number of other veterans. So we landed on Iwo Jima. We got in these transports and uh, we're going now along the parallel sands of Iwo Jima. I was in a transport with a guy named James Bradley. James Bradley uh, wrote the book, Flag of Our Fathers, which eventually, out of the trip that he was there, the one that I was on a few years ago, he was there because they were looking at eventually making a movie. Um, and out of that eventually became the movie that Clint Eastwood um, uh, directed. So he's giving an ongoing uh, commentary of the war happening as we're driving along these sands of Iwo Jima. I'm sitting also next to a man to my right, 60, uh, excuse me, a 78-year-old man. And I start asking him um, why you're here and they are there at the 60th anniversary of this war. And I'm shocked to be able to find this guy that I, I, you can see it on his face because his mind is reeling with memories that he had from 60 years earlier as an 18-year-old young man who was getting out of the boats and onto those very shores that we're driving parallel to. And he begins reflecting on the memories that he had as a young man and, and the war and the, and the battle buddies he had and the activities that were going on. And he hadn't been back on that island since those memories. And as a veteran, recalling those memories going on and conversations he had with his friends and things they did and none of it he recognized. I said, do you, do you recognize any of this? He said, no, because when we landed, everything was scraped. There was nothing on here except sand. At this point, there were some foliage and things that had grown up and we were headed to Mount Sarabachi. And as I'm listening to him, I'm reminded of how important it is in the older part of life to be able to look back on your younger years and have good memories and choices that you made as he made good choices about things that he was doing that now in the later years of his life with good taste in his, in his heart and mouth and mind because of the choices that he made. And if you can understand that very simply, you could understand why as our scriptures unfold for a young man that now in his later years of his life is penning his earlier years of his life and things and choices that he made that so shaped who and what he was. He was really, the Bible calls, the wisest man in the world. And if you have a copy of God's Word, turn to Ecclesiastes 2 and with another one of your fingers, turn to 1 Kings chapter 11, because I'd like to look very simply and briefly this morning at what I would call a foolish, wise man. Ecclesiastes 2 are these final words that he documents of, of his thinking. And let me read a verse or two here, and then let's turn to 1 Kings chapter 11. I'd like to just make three observations of this young man and then make one simple point to you this morning. I realize it's Monday morning and I realize also that um, you have a full week ahead of you. So if I can just hang one thought on your mind this morning and reinforce it for you, uh, I would feel like we've made some accomplishments. And then tomorrow, uh, rather than me fully preaching, I would I suggested maybe that Kevin, if he could sing and have a, have a time that I think would be a blessing to you. So, look at Ecclesiastes 2, because these are the very words that were penned, and this is the man called Solomon that makes the statement in verse 10 and 11 of chapter 2. This is how he said it. And whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from, from any of them. For my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my portion of all my labor. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had brought, and on the labor that I had labored to do, and behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit. All was of no profit, all was no gain, and all grief, and there was no profit under the sun. 
This is the same one that Solomon, who considered himself in Ecclesiastes 1, puts the key to, by the front door and he makes the same statement at the back door of the book when he says in verse 2, Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And at the end of his life, he's making the statements that all is vanity. And that's not a full truth, but in his mind, by what he reflected back on those early days, put him to that conclusion. And I would suggest to you, in reading through the life of Solomon, there's three basic observations that put him in this place, in this mindset. And the documentation of a critical tipping point of his life was found in 1 Kings 10. And so turn there, and let me give you these three observations. They're not complicated. The Bible's not a book of fables. It's an honest documentation, a history, and discovery of man's nature that hasn't changed much, no more than it was in my conversation with this 78-year-old man. That hearing him, I don't know that he was saying much different than it would be for you and I today. But very simply, when you look at Solomon's life and his, his records of his own personal observations and his own life, you'll end up finding that Solomon was in a place to have a whole lot coming at him. fact is, 1 Kings chapter 10, it says it this way in verse 26 through 29, And Solomon gathered together chariots and horsemen. He had 12,400 chariots, or um, 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horsemen whom he bestowed in the cities for chariots. And as a king, he made silver to be in Jerusalem as stones. I mean, there was so much there. And cedars made he as the sycamore trees or in the vale. There, there are an abundance of them. Solomon had horses brought out of Egypt and linen yard. The king's merchants received the linen yard at a price. He went on to talk about a chariot of 600 shekels of silver and a particular horse of 150. I mean, it was just a small clip of what was going on. Now... I would make these observations as a courage to jot them down. Number one, very simply, these are the danger signs when in Solomon's case he lost his spiritual balance because he's looking back and these were three critical parts. Number one, very simply, that things came too easy for him. He really was in a place that things came very easy for Solomon. Part of it is God's own blessing, the answer, answering to Solomon, Solomon, I'm giving you whatever you want. And Solomon found himself being able to ask the right, answer the right question by saying, I want wisdom. I need wisdom. And to his credit, that's what he got. And God used that in unbelievable ways. But Solomon was in a place that things really did come too easy for him. He was the son of David. Everything came his way. I wonder sometimes whether other choices of Adonijah, who would have been the people's choice. But here's Solomon who finds himself now in the throne. He had everything coming at him with all the things that he needed, and including all the stuff that was needed for the temple. His own father that gave 110 tons of gold and 260 tons of silver just for the temple. Solomon, who things came too easy for him in light of building his own house for 13 years. The temple was for seven. He had a lot coming at him. His own mother, Bathsheba, he had multiple uh, brothers and and yet things just came too easy for him. Number two, if you understand that, you could also understand very simply the fact that there really was no preacher to prophesy when Solomon was in Rome. fact is, in Ecclesiastes, when he read chapter 1, 1, he said, I, the preacher, he was the one that was calling the assembly together. Now listen, there was no one there as it was with David, his father, as a Nathan was to point his bony finger in his face and say, you're the man. There was no one there to say to Solomon, Solomon, you can't do that. And Solomon was in a place that he had no one there to state to him, this is what was right. He was the preacher. Now, someone online, Nathan, fell off the scene. He was there, and he, Nathan was there to put Solomon into the throne. But you don't find Nathan's name mentioned anywhere after that. Maybe he does show up somewhere. I just don't see it. You find a man, a Solomon, a very foolish and wise man. John Bright, the great Old Testament scholar, described Solomon graphically. This is how he described him in these short sentences. He said it this way, Few figures are more difficult to evaluate than Solomon. 
He was obviously a man of great astuteness who was able to realize the fullest and the possibilities of his economic future and the empire created by David, his father. But at the same time, he exhibited in other areas a blindness, not to say a blunt stupidity that hastened that empire to disintegration, unquote. I mean, Solomon was in a place, listen, that he had so many things coming at him, but the danger signs for his own spiritual balance got off when things came too easy for him. And there was no preacher to prophesy. And thirdly and lastly, and not necessarily fully, but understanding as well that his passions were untamed. Solomon was in a place that his own words in Ecclesiastes said that whatever his eyes wanted, he got. He was in a place that whatever he needed and he wanted, and his own documentation, he put it down, including 1 Kings 10, when you find the three things that God said in earlier, and why it's so specific in the Old Testament here in 1 Kings 10, that when he mentions about horses, he mentions about slaves, he mentions about his women, that all of these were things that got his head turned towards the very things, listen, that were very specific in Deuteronomy 17, when earlier years God said to the children of Israel, when you have a king, there's things I don't want him to do. And among those in Deuteronomy 17 was any uh, horses, any slaves, or any multiplication of, of horses, he says to himself, or multiplying women to himself. And those were the things that got Solomon's head turned. Now listen, what does all this mean? This is exactly what it means because you'll end up finding in 1 Kings 11 a phrase that's mentioned four times. And this is the very point I want to make with you today. Notice 1 Kings 11. This is how he says it. But King Solomon, not beyond just the horses and the slaves, but then comes 1 Kings 11 with the foreign wives. Solomon loved many strange women. And notice the phrase in verse 2. In the middle of it, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. And he says it again in verse 4. And it came to pass when Solomon uh, was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. In fact, is in verse 3. And his wives turned away his heart. And notice verse 9. And the Lord was angry with Solomon because the heart was turned from the Lord, God of Israel. This is what it says to me. Very simply, this is the spiritual truth. I'd encourage you to write it down in your Bible. Put it on your heart. Because if you gain nothing else today on a Monday morning, I'd want you to get this simple phrase. And this was the tipping point that took Solomon from an incredible use to being the foolish, wise man that he was. And it's an amazing um, point in which how could this happen? But this is what, very simply, it's understood that really what turned his head is what turned his heart. The Scripture says they turned his heart. And very simply, if you get nothing else, understand that what turns your head, that's what's going to turn your heart. The very things, as far as Solomon's wives are concerned, the very things that probably started as a political alliance became personal allowances. And those containers full of things that Solomon had were Solomon's own character was very empty. And I look at Solomon, I'm amazed to realize how in the world can this happen where somebody who, as wise of a man as Solomon, had a wandering eye. Because very simply, all of those things that turned his head is what turned his heart. And every time he found himself with down that chariot way that he went and another chariot that came by him, he thought, whoa, I've got to have that. And that's exactly what he got. And anything that turned his head ultimately is what turned his heart, including his own wives. And I think the simple application for you and I today, particularly for a generation that you are privileged to be a part of, a generation that is so God-blessed more than any other generation, it is so amazing to me that is there much difference between a generation, the golden years of Israel that had it all, and that many of you that have traveled to other parts of the world, when you come back to our God-blessed America, and I thank God for it, we're a territory as part of the United States. We end up having people that will give their years just to be able to get a passport and have a green card 
for the United States. In fact, my own daughter, the married Dominicans, right now here in Tampa, Florida, uh, trying to work it out to be able to get the paperwork so that she, her husband, can get her green card. It's a privilege. It's an honor including the Veterans Day that we celebrate to be able to recognize, listen, there are people that gave their lives for this. Some of you have friends, some of you have family that are serving right now in another part of the world that are giving their lives, including this pastor's boy. Happens all the time, every day. And I think from my own personal life, even at my young age, that I think, I don't know that I fully, fully embrace and recognize what a powerful opportunity that we have. But the reality is that when I end up looking at those things, I think, you know what? Maybe things do come too easy. Maybe things come too easy for us. Maybe things do come, come too easy not only in the stuff, but just living. Solomon finds himself in a place that there is no one really sitting there saying, this is what is right and this is what is wrong. And Solomon, you know, you had to read, you had to be exposed to Deuteronomy in order to become a king. You knew exactly what choices you were making when you decided to send it down to Egypt and get the horses and get the chariots and get the slaves and have it all there. And you knew that if you start taxing the people, you're going to do exactly what God said was going to hurt that economy. And I would say to you, particularly you right here and a wonderful call that you are, all three of those signs of losing your spiritual balance are all the things, listen, that this is what this school is trying to help you with. You're in a place to having people say to you, don't do that. That's why you have chapels like this. You have people coming in that saying to you, this is what's right, this is what's wrong, and don't be tolerant of tolerance. This is a place that you've been having, even as it was with Solomon, that hearing truth and making choices. And really, ultimately, what's going to turn your head is what's going to turn your heart. That's why when you, gentlemen, find yourself in places that the very thing that snaps your head is the very thing that's going to steal your heart and your very passions for God Himself. That's why you have scenarios that you have on this campus where some things you just can't do. So you embrace that to realize these are not just restrictions, but they're protective measures to help you. I don't think your administration sits there and thinks, you know what, let's make our students miserable. They're way too happy. Let's make it harder for them. The reality is, they're saying, we love them so much, let's do what we can to protect them. Because ultimately, you will move into a world in which they'll be saying to you, just as it was in Solomon's day, you don't need to tame your passions. You can be in a place to say, I'm going to take all that. Because ultimately, curiosity is what got Solomon. Because it turned his head. And I wonder, and that's what turned his heart. And the very passions that he had for the God that God spoke to him are the very things that stole his heart. <clears throat> and curiosity is the sharpest hook in Satan's tackle box. And that's why he uses it so wisely as Satan, who is your adverse enemy to you, knows, I just got to put that into the water. That's exactly why Paul later puts it into the format of a military metaphor when he says you've got to be in a place to recognize that there is spiritual warfare going on and be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. So what does that say to us as I conclude? Very simply, this lesson, and this is a life lesson, that you restrain your passion with spiritual accountability. <clears throat> you get yourself in a place to realize that you know the best place that I can be is the place in which that I have got to restrain my passions. God put them into your heart and life to have a passion for Him. But God is saying to you, as it was with Solomon, that you've got to put yourself in a place of spiritual accountability. That's the greatest place you can be in. Because Solomon didn't have someone preaching in him. He didn't have a position where he chose to say, I can just have whatever I want. And the things came too easy for him put himself in a place to realize that just later on, when Solomon documents these truths, he didn't listen to his own advice. He didn't guard his heart with all wisdom, for out of it were the issues of life. He didn't take that advice. And it really is a paradox to wonder how all this took place, but I can say to you very simply that what turned his head turned his heart. You find yourself in a place, whether most of the time it's not in public, 
but in private because what turns your head, that's what's going to turn your heart. You're on the web and you pull something up on the screen and that turns your head, that's going to turn your heart. And if your heart is fast after God, as it was in the book of Acts 11, when it says they turn their heart to the Lord, that Satan's going to do all he can. Your spiritual adversity is going to be totally opposed to you because it's going to cause you to choose, I'm not going to turn my head. I'm going to let my eyes look straight on. Because the rest of this is not going to help me. It's going to hurt me. Because the very things that God did in Solomon's life, with Solomon as the one that later he said twice God spoke to him. Twice he was the very man in the temple, in building of that temple, when God came to him first and said, whatever you want, that God spoke to him very clearly and distinctly. And later when the temple is built, he's the one there on his knees with his hands uplifted and saying, God, you are in the presence of the very temple that we built that no one could even go in. And the whole nation was committed to loving God and have a passion for God. Wouldn't it be great with our own country of people like this falling on our knees and saying, God, you are God. It's not about America. It's about God. And yet, how in the world could someone be in a place that is Solomon that twice God spoke to him and it was just a few short years later? Because what turned his head turned his heart. And I would say to you, as it was, as we learn a lesson from a very life to help us realize that you've got to restrain your passion with spiritual accountability. Most of you, over the next week, uh, are going to be not here. You're going somewhere else. And I would encourage you, if you make choices right now, to say, God, there are certain places that I know will turn my head. There are certain things that I know I cannot handle. And I've got to restrain my passion. You know, it was such a blessing when this older man, as we pulled up to Mount Sarabachi, got out of the transport. James Bradley, who ended up going up on top of Mount Sarabachi, and I'm standing there, and he said, would you be willing to take a picture? James Bradley's father was the one of the five men that lifted the flag on the top of Mount Sarabachi as that flag of victory. His dad was the corpsman. He was one of the few men that ended up later leaving Iwo Jima early, taking a tour, raising money for the United States to pay for the war. He was the only man, James Bradley's father, was the only man, as he said to me, and documented his book, Flag of Our Fathers, it was the only guy that ended up not going off the deep end or things happening to them that ruined their own life. And I remember James Bradley saying, my father had incredible ability to stay focused on what he was doing. And I would say to you, my friend, all hell is opposed to what you're doing, my friend. All heaven is applauding you. But you stay focused on what's going on and I promise you, it'll be worth it. It really will. Let's pray together. Father, I'm thankful that you do love us, you care about us, you promise to never leave us or forsake us, and ask that in these days ahead, we would not forget those years of in which people gave their lives for us, people willing to sacrifice. There's a generation here, a young generation, that many of them have such a passion for you, that we would applaud them and encourage them to continue on. We realize what turns our heads is going to turn our heart. Help us restrain those passions with spiritual accountability and having people, our roommates and our people on our floor to have that oneness that we wouldn't be at a point in life later if you so tarry to look back on our young lives and realize what we could have been. Help us to be able to have that spiritual metaphor of a soldier aiming forward knowing that the great King of Kings will be here someday. And even as your word states, as Jesus said, there was someone that's greater than Solomon that is here, referring to his own blessed life, it was used as sacrifice of payment for our own sin and giving us the spiritual authority to live a life through the resurrected power of Christ. Pray that we would be pleasing in your sight. Thank you for the school. Have your hand on it in Jesus' name.